Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to church this morning. It's good to see everyone here together as we come together in worship. I trust that this uh, service will be a blessing to us all. Uh, our call to worship this morning comes from Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's come before the Lord in a time of prayer as we seek his blessing on our service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning in worship, we pray that you will uh, be amongst us by your Spirit, that you will fill our hearts with your love, uh, that we might worship you in, in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray that we might be encouraged and built up in our faith this morning, and that our worship might indeed be uh, pleasing to you and bring glory to your name. Through which we pray. Amen. Let's stand. This morning as we come to worship, we acknowledge that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let's begin our worship together with the song As We Gather. first reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 6, from verses 27 to 38. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, 
And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. These words are so uh, familiar to us, and yet uh, they're really quite radical when compared to normal human behaviour. That we would seek the good of others rather than ourselves, that we would promote other people's needs ahead of our own. That even our enemies who've wronged us or hurt us should be met with love and compassion with mercy and forgiveness rather than judgment. But this is what the Christian life is about. This is how we're called to live in this world. And Jesus in the passage gives us the ultimate example of that when he talks about his uh, Father, God the Father himself. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And of course we know that God the Father showed that mercy to us by sending his Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to suffer for sinners, his enemies, and to be our Saviour and Redeemer. And this is the example that should inspire us to be merciful, just as our Father in heaven is merciful. The Apostle John wrote, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. <coughs> Let's stand and sing a bracket of two songs that talk about this uh, love of Jesus, the deep, deep love of Jesus, and then... May the mind of Christ our Saviour. Let's stand to sing.
like to lead us now in our congregational prayer this morning. And, um, let's just come together and pray. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the freedom and the opportunity to worship you and praise you. We're aware that in so many parts of our world, um, people don't have that freedom. Where they are persecuted because they love you, because they want to worship you. And uh, we think of those people as they, in their homes or elsewhere, worship you. May your spirit be with them and strengthen them. And may they too one day find the joy and the happiness that we enjoy in worshipping you. Lord, we are mindful of some in our midst who are not well. We think uh, particularly of Yako and um, his health and his family. And we pray for them for strength at this time. Lord, may your peace be with them. May you comfort them and uh, shelter them as only you can. Lord, uh, we are mindful of the uh, um, Osinger family and also the Marricks as they um, grieve the loss those, of those they dearly loved. May you be with them and comfort them. Lord, um, we think of Ar uh, Arne Borthausen and continue to pray for his um, health. Um, it was just good to see um, Yvonne uh, recently and um, for her just to have some fellowship with us and uh, we pray for her continued uh, strength and her um, caring for Arne. But we think of this week as school starts again for families um, as they um, prepare their children for school and uh, that term begins again. For those teachers who uh, teach them and for schools that, um, as they govern that, Lord be with them and bless them all this time. Thank you, Lord, for the holidays that many of us have been able to enjoy and a uh, time of uh, fellowship with friends and with family and um, a time of um, being restored and strengthened. We continue to pray for Andrew and Christine de Vries as they consider our call. And um, Lord, as we um, communicate with them and um, spend time with them to... Uh, just inform them where we are and where we're at as a congregation and our needs. Lord, um, we just pray that uh, we may, you may bless that time and um, that if you've called them here, that in due course that may happen. Lord, uh, we just pray for the remainder of this service, Lord, as uh, Darren brings us your word. Lord, um, may we be encouraged and strengthened in our walk with you. Lord, this we ask in your name. Let's um, stand and sing together, Brother, Let Me Be Your Servant, and then uh, followed by the scripture readings.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 28 through to the end of the chapter, verse 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And our text this morning comes from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depths of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. A few weeks ago, Marty began a series from Reverend Josh Hartog on Philippians. So this is the second sermon in that series that we're going to continue with, titled Praying with Joy. Uh, the first sermon in this series was on Paul's, on Paul's letter to the Philippians. was called Living a Life of Joy. We looked at the secret to living a life of joy, and the secret is Jesus Christ. We looked at how the secret to living a life of joy is found in giving your life in service to Jesus, remembering that in Christ we are saints, and that through our Lord Jesus Christ, we can experience grace and peace. 
the last sermon wasn't just the introduction to this new series. It was also the introduction of Paul's letter. But today we are getting into the letter itself. And the first thing Paul does is pray. And he doesn't just pray. According to verse 4, he prays with joy. In fact, Paul says, I always pray with joy. This morning we're going to look at this idea of praying with joy. And I don't know about you, but I'm very excited about learning to pray with joy. Because sometimes prayer can be defined by words like duty or boring or frustrating. But Paul prays with joy. This morning we're going to look at why Paul prays with joy and what this prayer looks like. So let's start with Paul's reasons for praying with joy. Paul gives four reasons. The first is that Paul, Paul, Paul isn't praying for stuff. Rather, he's praying for people. Paul starts by saying, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Paul uses a really simple structure to say two things in those two verses. Notice the centre of Paul's prayer. It's all about them. Paul remembers them, and so Paul prays for them. Paul is always praying for them, not just sometimes. And Paul prays for all of them, not just some of them. Paul is praying for everyone in the church in Philippi. And then notice the two phrases that stand like bookends surrounding them. Firstly, Paul's thanks to God for them. And then Paul's joy as he prays for them. I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul's focus on people results in thanksgiving and joy. Paul is praying for people he knows, people who he has spent significant time with, people who matter to God and to him. And they're not perfect people, but Paul is absolutely chuffed at the people that God has brought into the church, the people that God has brought into his life, the people that he gets to pray for. I wonder if our prayers are sometimes not filled with joy because we aren't praying for people. I wonder if you spent time praying for the person beside you and the person in the row behind you and the guy who's off in the Solomons and the family that's on holidays, whether your prayers might become a little more exciting. Do you stop and thank God for the people that he's brought into your life? Do you get excited about the opportunity you have to bring these people sitting around you this morning before God in prayer? Paul prays with joy because he prays for people. Paul's second reason is found in verse 5. Paul prays with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. When Paul prays for the Christians in Philippi, he is filled with joy because they are partners with him in the gospel. So what does Paul mean when he talks about their partnership in the gospel? What Paul means is that like him, they believe the gospel. The word partnership in the Greek is the word koinonia, which is often translated as fellowship or having something in common. And what Paul and the Christians in Philippi have in common is their faith in the gospel. The good news that because Jesus died on the cross for their sins, they have been reconciled with God. They are united in their commitment to the truths of the gospel. And it was the gospel that first united them and it's the gospel 
that still unites them. And that's so important for us to remember. It's not our Dutch heritage that unites us. It's not our social economic status that unites us. It's not even the fact that we all speak English that unites us. It's the gospel that unites us. In fact, the gospel unites all believers, whether you're Reformed or Baptist or Pentecostal, whether you're contemporary or traditional, whether you're alive or been dead 500 years. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that we all share. When Paul calls us partners, he is referring to the fact that we are committed to something bigger than ourselves, that we are a part of Christ's body, the church, that we are citizens of God's kingdom. Paul prays with joy for these people because they are part of his family. He sees them as his brothers and sisters in Christ. I wonder if our feelings about one another would be more joyful if we saw each other as partners in the gospel, as fellow believers. Thirdly, Paul prays with joy because God will complete his work in them. In verse 6, Paul says, Being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Literally, he says, I am confident of this. And the thing Paul is so confident about is that God will complete his work in their lives. This is one of the clearest verses that teach the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. The other two are John 10, 27 and 28 and Romans 8, 38 and 39. I encourage you to look them up when you get home. But let's take a look at Philippians 1, verse 6. Firstly, what is this good work that Paul mentions? I think Paul has in mind the fact that they believed the gospel. The good work is the work of salvation of believing in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus said, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. God's work is bringing us to faith in his Son. Secondly, Paul makes it clear that God starts the work of salvation. If it was left up, left up to us to save ourselves, we'd all be doomed. Because of our sinful nature, we naturally chose to reject God. The very fact that we believe the gospel is evidence of God's work in our hearts. Elsewhere, Paul says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Our faith is God's work. We so often focus on the fact that I believed, or I chose to follow Jesus. But the spiritual reality is that even our faith is a gift from God. We choose Jesus because God first chose us. Jesus reminded his disciples, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Thirdly, God will finish his work. This is our hope as Christians, that, we, that God won't desert us, that he won't give, give up on us. And that's Paul's point here. What God starts, he also finishes. In Romans 8, Paul says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, 
he also glorified. Notice the progression there. God chose or predestined those he would save. God called us. God justified us. And God will glorify us. God will complete his work in us. And that work is making us like Jesus. God saved us for a purpose and he's slowly but surely transforming us into the likeness of his son. Think about that for a moment. God is so delighted in his son, Jesus Christ, that he has saved millions of people in order that Jesus might reproduce himself in them. God wants us to become just like his son and he will do it. One day we will be just like Jesus when Jesus returns and makes all things new. And it's this truth that gives Paul such confidence when he prays for the Christians in Philippi. Paul is confident that God knows what he is doing. Paul is confident that things will turn out exactly as God plans. Paul is confident that no matter how messed up people might be, that God is at work. God is at work in us and he will finish his work. And finally, Paul prays with joy because they share in God's grace. Verses 7 and 8. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Again, Paul is praying for all of you. And the reason he's he is so excited about these people is that they share in God's grace. They are all recipients of God's undeserved favour in Jesus Christ. God has lavishly poured out his love on them so that they are no longer enemies but his children. Paul's joy comes from the fact that he understands God's grace. Paul knows that he, he was undeserving of God's love and that it was only because of God's love that he was saved. And Paul knows that God feels the same way about the Christians in Philippi. Paul knows that God loved them so much that he saved them as well. Paul's joy is fueled by his knowledge of just how much God loves them. Listen to the four little phrases that give a glimpse of that. He says, It is right for me to feel or think this way about you. Why? Because that's how God feels about them. God thinks they are awesome, and if God thinks they are awesome, so too does Paul. Then he says, I have you in my heart. Paul has them in his heart because God has them in his heart. God cares deeply about these people in Philippi. And because God cares, so too does Paul. And then Paul says, I long for you. Paul wants nothing more than to be with them, to fellowship with them. And Paul longs for them because God does. God wants nothing more than to fellowship with us. In fact, God wanted it so much, he was willing to die to make it possible. And Paul makes his point in his final words, I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul loves these guys with the same affection as Jesus loves them. The word translated affection is basically the word guts. Like Jesus loves us with everything in him, so Paul loves them with all his guts. 
Now I have to ask you, do you love the people around you like that? Do you understand just how much God loves them? Do you understand that God loves the people sitting around you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in their place so that they could have a relationship with him? <coughs> Do you think about your fellow brothers and sisters like that? Because it is right to feel that way about them because that's how God feels about them. Do you have them in your heart? Do you think about them and pray about them every day? Do you long for them? Do you take every opportunity to spend time with them? Do you go, I don't feel like going to church or small group, but because they are there, I'll go. I want to spend time with them because they matter to God. Because Jesus loves them, I'm going to love them as well. Maybe if we prayed for others as partners in the gospel, people whom God is at work in, as people God loves and who have received his grace. Imagine the joy that would pour out of us, praying for each other that way. So they are the four reasons Paul prays with such joy. But what does this prayer of joy look like? How does someone filled with joy pray? What do they pray for? Well, that's what we're going to see in the next three verses. Paul starts, and this is my prayer. And Paul asks God for one thing, and then he tells us why he wants that for them giving three outcomes that will result. So let's start with what Paul wants for them. The rest of verse 9 says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. What Paul wants is that their love may abound. Paul wants God's love to overflow into and then out of their lives. So what does this abounding love look like? Firstly, it means our love increases. Paul talks about how our love is to abound more and more. What does it mean for your love to increase? It means that if God's love is pouring into your life, then your love for your spouse should be growing. It means that your love for your children is meant to grow. Yes, they are frustrating. But as you grow in your understanding of God's love for you in Jesus, then your level of patience and gentleness towards your kids will also grow. It means your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ will grow. We just looked at how Paul's prayer life is filled with joy and thankfulness and confidence because of his understanding of God's love for the Christians in Philippi. It means your love for the lost will grow. It means your love for the weak and the ostracised will grow. When God's love abounds in our lives, our love for others increases. Secondly, it increases in knowledge. Paul isn't talking about some sort of wishy-washy, sentimental kind of love, but a love that is based on a clear understanding of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Our love will never increase unless we grow in the knowledge of God's love for us. And the best way to grow in the knowledge of God's love is to read about God's love for us in the passages of scripture. According to 1 John 3 verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. When we know God's love for us in Jesus, our love for others grows.
Thirdly, it increases in insight. This word in the Greek is only used in two other places. Luke uses it to describe how the disciples didn't grasp what Jesus meant when he predicted his death. Its meaning was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it. The point was that the Holy Spirit hadn't opened their minds to understand what Jesus was saying. The writer of the Hebrews talks about mature believers who have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. These two verses help us see that there is a spiritual dimension to God's love. The Holy Spirit helps us understand how best to love others. God gives us insight into people's lives so that we can love them more effectively. That's the sort of love that Paul asks God to give, not only to the Christians in Philippi, but us sitting here this morning. My prayer for you is that God's love will abound in your life so that as your knowledge of God's love increases and the depth of your insight increases, that your love for others may increase also. So let's take a look at why Paul prays that our love may increase. And the answer is found in verse 10. So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. As our love increases, we are able to discern what is best. In our day and age, we are bombarded with options. When we go to the supermarket to buy milk, there is not just milk. There is skim milk and calcium enriched milk and omega-3 milk and low-fat milk and smart milk. And it's ridiculous. I think uh, Red Hartog was thinking of that ad that was on TV many years ago. Well, when it comes to choosing a mobile phone provider, you have to compare the monthly rental and the call costs and the data <coughs> allowance and the coverage. How do you choose what's best? According to Paul, when your life abounds with God's love, it helps you discern what is best. What's really important becomes clearer. And according to Paul, what matters most is that we are pure, that we don't allow sin to clog up the flow of God's love in our lives. The two words he uses speak of purity in terms of having pure motive, yeah. of being sincere, and of having a pure conscience, of being blameless. Later, Paul talks about focusing on whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent or praiseworthy. And of course, that means getting rid of whatever is false or indecent or wrong or impure or unlovely or contemptible, or second-rate, or worthy of condemnation. As God's love increases in us, so does our awareness of what is good and right. A life abounding in God's love will not only increase in love and discernment, but it will also be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. When Paul talks about fruit, he talks about what is visible for everyone to see. This isn't how God sees us as righteous in Christ, but the result of our right relationship with him. Just like you can walk past an apple tree and tell it's an apple tree because it's got apples on it, so people should be able to see that we are Christians by our fruit because we behave like Jesus Christ. And the truth is that we can't bear fruit unless we have a person, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, If a man remains in me 
and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he can do nothing. Finally, a life abounding in love and discernment is a life lived to the glory and praise of God. As God's love abounds in us and increases our love for others and our ability to discern, to discern what is best, and as it produces fruit in our lives, God gets the glory and the praise. Our greatest joy will be giving God all the credit for what he has done for our lives. One commentator uses the formula for electricity as an illustration. Volts times amps equals watts. Volts measure the pressure, amps measure the flow, and watts measure the power. God's love is the pressure that builds up in our lives. But our lives need to be free from resistance which impede the flow or condensers which store it up for private use. But if God's love is allowed to flow through our lives, it results in the fruit of righteousness that brings glory to God. Brothers and sisters, my prayer is that God's love will abound in your life that you will get rid of anything that might hamper its flow so that it produces fruit for his glory. That's the prayer of someone who loves their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, who sees them as partners in the gospel, who is confident of God's work in their lives and who understands God's grace and his undeserved love for them. When we think of others as God thinks of them in our prayers, sorry, when we think of others as God thinks of them, our prayers will be filled with joy and a desire to see God's love grow and increase in their lives for God's glory. This morning, I hope you have been inspired to pray for your brothers and sisters and to pray with great joy. Um, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your loving grace that you show towards us. We thank you for sending your Son to die so that we may have fellowship with you. We pray that we may grow in love and knowledge and insight. Help us, Lord, to see others as you see them, that we may see our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as partners in the gospel, that you love and in whom you are working, that we may see the lost and love them as you do, for it is your desire that none shall perish and that all may come to faith in Christ and be saved. May your love abound in our lives and bear fruit, and help us to pray with joy for one another. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and to bring you glory. Amen. The final song this morning, we sing, uh, Let There Be Love. So please stand.
join us in the hall for cuppa after church. And can I encourage you all to email Pastor Andrew DeVries and uh, just introduce yourself and uh, make contact with him and let him know that you're praying for him as he considers the calls and uh, pray for discernment for him as he decides uh, his future. A benediction this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen.